Hello, everyone, and welcome to Textiles and Tea. My name is Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager, and I'm going to be your host today. Today's sponsor is Taproot Video Cooperative. Taproot Video is a cooperative of nationally known instructors who are banding together to provide um, more um, workshops available to the wide community. To learn more about their website, please go to taprootvideo.com. We will take questions today for the last 15 minutes. If you would, would you please put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat? Um, you can please put all the comments you want in chat, but if you have a question, put it in Q&A and that way we'll be sure to see it. Today, we are having a few technical difficulties. <laughs> That's why there was no music and we're struggling to get our images up, but we will get them. Uh, before the end of the program today, bear with us. Today we have Carol James. Since the 1980s, Carol has been exploring a wide flat braiding technique known as finger weaving. Then in the 1990s, she discovered spraying and it was love at first sight. Carol is a well-known teacher and has spent the last 20 years rediscovering textile forms that have been considered lost resurrecting these ancient techniques and making them accessible to everyone. Carol is also the author of three books, several eBooks and pattern collections. She's highly regarded teacher and has taught throughout her home country of Canada, the US, New Zealand and Europe. She has exhibited throughout the United States and Canada, and some of you have been fortunate enough to see her strut down the runway at the Convergence Fashion Show. Hey, Carol, welcome. Hi. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm doing really well. Well, good. I'm glad. We're uh, finally getting springtime. We're, we're getting having a little spring. technical, but we'll get there, okay? Well, my first question is always the most important. What is your favorite tea? Mostly I'm a coffee person, but um, when I was visiting friends in Europe, I, in England, I found some Yorkshire tea that's really quite nice. Okay. So in the summertime, mid-afternoon, Yorkshire you go. tea is quite there nice. I know I have to get used to the idea that we're now drinking iced tea now instead of hot tea. So I gotta kind of switch that over. <laughs> so tell me, how did you first get started in fibers? I first got started in fibers because that's the way my mother figured she'd entertain her daughters. So um, this German Austrian ethic of <clears throat> idle mind is the workshop of the devil sort of thing. I was kept busy with um, crochet and embroidery before I went to kindergarten. I was going through my mother's uh, linen closet a while back and I found a piece that had this embroidery on it. She had, this was before I read and she had traced out, Carol did this, and the date was before I started kindergarten. Wow. Uh, yeah, at a very early age, I was exposed to textile stuff, and I loved it. Oh, that's great. That's great. Now, can you talk a little bit about spraying? Just a brief description. I think most people know what spraying is, but there's always a few people who aren't quite familiar with spraying. And then talk some about what makes you so passionate about spraying and the whole uh, finger weaving. Well, um, spraying is a braiding technique. When you have three strings tied together uh -huh. and you work a three strand braid, if they're tied at the other end, Anybody who's braided someone with really long hair, you braid up here and then you get a mirror image braid at the bottom. That's the basic idea behind spraying. So in the background here, I have a frame here. And if I work the threads at the top, I get a mirror image thing at the bottom. It's a very ancient textile method. Come to find out earliest evidence is the Neolithic age, way, way, way back. It's a really cool technique. A lot of people associate it with really elastic kind of things, but it can also be dense, almost windproof. Um, a wide variety of patterns, um, like the shirt that I'm wearing here, um, was done using that spraying technique. I'm passionate about it because it it's so incredibly versatile and nobody seems to know about it. And it just feels like, it feels like the technique called to me. 
and said, Carol, <laughs> Um, I, I'm quite familiar with a number of techniques. I taught knitting for a number of years. I've done hard anger tatting, all kinds of stuff. But the technique that seems to really, really need somebody to spread the word, the technique is spraying. And it's so cool because anything you can do with knitting, you can do with spraying. Any kind yeah. of garments that can be knitted have been done with spraying, um, including full body suits, apparently the enemies of the ancient Greeks wore shirts and pants that were made using a spraying technique. It's cool. Ancient Greek? That one, there was, a, there was an exhibit that went around a couple of years ago, um, Gods in Color, I think was the name of the exhibit. And you can type in the computer, Gods in Color. And what should come up is this exhibit from um, the Glippotech Museum in Munich. And um, they had exhibits of all kinds of statues and pottery and whatever from ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. Primarily, where they um, where that were painted, brightly colors. And the interesting thing is, their enemies, um, the Persians, the Amazons, um, they they depict them wearing these brightly colored shirts and pants that are kind of close fitting. And um, their research is that the technique you use to make all of those designs is spraying. Huh? I didn't realize it was that old. Oh, it's well, very... I'm throwing this in. This wasn't in the. The rehearsal or when I was talking to you earlier, <clears throat> I was at Convergence. This is my Carol Jane's story. I was at Convergence and it had to be like Milwaukee or Rhode Island. It was a while back. You weren't teaching then. And I, it was when HGA had the big booth and we had these crates, wire crates set up that books were in. And people kept gathering outside the booth and then they would disperse. And then they would come back and then they were dispersed. And I was so busy, I couldn't get over there to see what was going on. And I thought, what is going on? So finally, I kind of ran over there real quick and I look around the corner and there you sit demoing and teaching. And you looked at me and you're like, is, is this okay? Because I didn't think you were tied on to one of the crates, you know, as a, a an anchor of some kind or whatever. And I'm like, yes, this, this is wonderful. But I was just so struck by your passion and your dedication and taking the initiative because you were there on your own nickel. You weren't there teaching. So this was just something that, you... that, that was probably Florida. Okay. Either Florida or Albuquerque, because ever since then I've been, I've been teaching. But I was so struck that you took the initiative and you wanted so badly to share with people what, you know, this, this technique. I just thought that was wonderful. <laughs> so let yeah. me ask you, go ahead. Uh, okay, so, so Carol's passion and um, I brought my daughter along with to HGA. Um, partly because I wanted a roommate and um, I thought that would be kind of a nice thing to share. The first HGA we went to, um, was she 20? We were in an elevator going up and there were, you know, 20 other women packed in and somebody had her loom. And so somebody was saying, oh, what kind of loom? And what kind of, what kind of set do you get off of that? And what kind of read you got on there? And we got off the elevator and my daughter said, mom, on that elevator, there must have been 20 people and they all knew what the loom was. She said, like, that was so amazing to her. She said, these people, mom, these people make you look almost normal. So true. That's so true. <laughs> so, so that this, what, what seems bizarre in many other circles, um, I feel normalized by That's HGA. Wonderful. I love that. That's a great story. That's a great story. Well, let me ask you something. Um, I've asked a couple of people this. Do you see yourself as an artist or an artisan? Both, neither? When I sit there demonstrating, people will say, oh my gosh, you're such an artist. And I, my feeling is what I'm doing is I've reverse engineered stuff that I've seen from the past. And I don't see most of what I do, I see as technical recreation from the past, from the past and then applying it to the present. Um, it must've been possible to make sprang leggings because clearly the ancient Persians did sprang leggings. So how the heck, and it looks like those medieval striped leggings are 
So how the heck? So I'm I'm working to reverse engineer, um, as well as shirts, all kinds of stuff. I mostly see myself as artisan, really. Well, I was reading your blog and you were talking about um, taking the plunge and teaching online. So what do you think you've learned about yourself and yourself as an artist by taking on that new challenge like that? Teaching online has stretched me quite a bit. Um, a year ago, I was saying, I'm not gonna teach online. I can't imagine being able to communicate through to students. But I have learned that I am a good teacher and that uh, people can learn from me. What I have learned is my great need for um, the assistance, the support of others, <laughs> my, my need for the internet, <laughs> my need for a stable internet, uh, but also uh, my need for a companion instructors, like what Taproot Video gives me, contact with others, um, small little comments that other instructors made huge difference to me, um, feedback from other instructors, feedback from students, uh, feedback from my student, who's now my, my, my daughter, who now moderates a lot of my classes. I've learned of my need for other people. Um, that's been huge. And I've also learned I have a huge following. Which, which has quite a responsibility that. to uh, make sure that I'm um, giving a good example. <laughs> <laughs> but you're surprised about that? That you have a big phone? Yeah, actually I am. Oh I am. Um, for as often as I hear, I never heard about Sprang before. Gee, you know, what is that? Oh, you know, I, um, people say I tripped on your website. I didn't realize it was there. Um, and because, you know what, I'm just not a social media person. I just, I, I yeah, I know, I know what you mean. You know, like once in a while, I'll say to my daughter, okay, now show me how Facebook works again. Okay. And I'll get that all figured out. And then the next time I go on, it's all different and I can't find anything. And it's like, you know what, the other thing is get on there. I have so many other things to do to spend time there. It's, you know, is time I, I could have written eight patterns, but in that time, you know, like, yeah. Do you, you find that you when you're saying that, I think about how many times I'm taking a new class, a new technique, and I, I feel the same way. It's like, okay, I got this. I got this. And then the next day, it's like, I don't remember how to do this. I don't know what the next step is. So, you know, you, you, you're, you share that with your students when they're trying to figure out, you know, how to do the next step. <laughs> yeah. Um, you have a big interest in the history of Spring. Um, did, were you always interested in history as a topic or is it just the rich um, history of Spring? We have three images here of um, the George Washington sash is in the middle, right? And the roulette sash is on the right, right. and then the general Brock is on the left, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, that's correct. So, was it history in general you loved, or the, just the history of spring? Um, well, I I didn't really enjoy history that much in school. Uh -huh. What got me interested in history was when my father said, "You know, we all you need to travel," and he took us kids on trips to see things. I remember one year we went up the East Coast, and um, seeing things, seeing Colonial Williamsburg, how people lived. We went to George Washington's Mount Vernon and Tom, Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. And just seeing, being in the place, seeing how people lived, how people did things, it just, we went to Gettysburg. And I remember I thinking like, I've heard of these, I've heard of this stuff, but it like, it went into my brain in such a different way. It, I, I just, it, it was quite an awakening for me, experiencing that kind of thing. So um, I, I got into historic um, reenactment and I moved around with my husband quite a bit and he got a job here in Winnipeg and I know nobody in Winnipeg. I, I have no connections here. I, so he goes off to work and he's got work colleagues and me and the kids, like I know nobody. So one of the things I did was I reached out to a local, there's a kind of a semi-historic site about a 10 minute walk from here. And they were taking volunteers. So we signed up as volunteers to reenact 18, 
1820, 1816 kind of stuff, which meant I got to have to make outfits. And then the kids, we'd go there and they'd spend the afternoon throwing axes and demonstrating candle dipping, whatever, having a great afternoon. After the public leaves, then the organizers have pizza. So, you know, like free pizza. We come home and they're ready for bed. It was great. And I could talk with other adults and I could get to know a little bit more about local history, about how the city grew, uh, you know, what kind of politics and and just general adult discussions um so it was it was um not necessarily because of the history but because i needed to learn about the place and i and it just seemed like really good fun one of the things that they liked about me was that i did finger weaving and then people started other other historic sites museums organizations had a special day they started calling on me because i did finger weaving and i was a sash weaver and then at one of these events, there's some military reenactors guys, and they said, oh, you make sashes, sprang, uh, finger weaving sashes, that's nothing. Can you do sprang? We need sprang sashes. And I said, what's sprang? And that pulled me into a whole other area. Um, there were two books in the public library on sprang. One was Peter Collingwood and the other was Hella Skoronsky. And that's how I learned about sprang. And I found it's so much more than sashes. There is so much you can do at that point, I had gotten myself to be a knitting instructor for the city, um, but I thought, you know, there's lots of people can teach knitting, but mm -hmm. Sprang really needs somebody exploring a bit more and teaching and then writing up the patterns and helping people learn about it. So uh, the history of it is spectacular. Um, I then try to finagle reasons to travel and see these pieces and then um, talking to the museum curator or archeologists and well, actually, looking at it is one thing, to, but to be able to touch, to touch an actual piece and see how that behaves is a whole other ballgame. Um, well, that kind of leads me to my next question, which is um, many of the works, as you're saying, is you did a replica of um, a piece that you saw somewhere or you read about or whatever. And we have these images of the um, a sash from the Hermitage, which is in St. Petersburg, Russia. And then these gloves, these lace gloves were inspired by a Coptic bonnet, right? In uh, London, in a museum in London. So do you travel to places like London and Europe when you're teaching to go find these pieces so you can replicate them? Well, it um, six of one, half a dozen of another. That um, sash, the finger woven sash, the zigzags, the W pattern, from St. Petersburg, that was a photo. Someone had passed me a photo of a sash they taken through glass. I did, however, later get to St. Petersburg in person. Um, there is a textile group, the Sieta. It's a organization of textile workers, uh, textile. Uh, it's a French, the French Textile Museum, the organization associated with that, and they have conferences. And so that means I get to have to go or, um, try to figure out how to fund my way to go. So trying to get people who would pay to have a class, <laughs> it's kind of a way to fund the travel. And then I also, it, it's, I, love, I love spreading the word, so I love teaching. But um, then while I'm there, might as well check out the museum. Those lace gloves were based on, it's a, just a little fragment of a piece from the Petri Museum. The Petri, I heard about the Petri Museum because I've seen a picture of a lovely sprang bonnet that's on a it's like on a severed head a mummified head and i wanted to see it and i wrote to the petri museum and they said you know we also have this little fragment and i thought oh yeah a little piece of fragment i'm going to get anything off of that but it's a spectacular little piece and the the design in there is really kind of intriguing because that that lace stitch is a really different stitch um i i do travel because looking at textiles in person is always so much more enlightening than textiles in photos. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of museums do have digital images. It's still good to go and see them in person um, because the photographer has taken one image, but there's other things that you need to see, you know, from other angles or what's off the edge. Um, yeah. Well, um, you are preparing to release a ebook, right, on a collection of patterns, Dutch patterns. Can you tell us about that? Why, why this collection? Why make that into an ebook? Okay, one of the, my first trips to Europe, 
I um, was introduced to this woman, this Kobe Rindis boss. So her picture is there. She's on the lower right so quarter of your screen. Um, she had learned Sprang from one of the big, uh, a, pe a person who's really important in Sprang in history um, from the early 1900s, Elizabeth Van Riesimo. She had learned Sprang and then she had been pursuing Sprang all along. And in the 1970s, 1980s, she said a lot of local organizations are all going back to their roots. And in the Netherlands, a lot of these organizations have sashes associated with their collections. And she said in the 1970s, 1980s, they're pulling out all these sashes. There are spraying sashes and they're all in really bad shape. And so they brought them all to her to repair. So she was taking pictures of the sashes in their bad condition and then repaired. But just, and then that led to taking, um, I think the organizations were quite interested and they went looking around. Anyhow, this book was created partly um, after her efforts to restore sashes and bringing up um, highlighting their existence. Um, military sashes in the 1700s, like George Washington's sash, a lot of them have ex elaborate, exquisitely elaborate patterns in them. So she was telling me about this back in 2013, and she pulled out this book that had been published. It's a spiral bound book. And I said, wow, I don't read Dutch. There's a lot of text in there, which I don't read, but the pictures, the designs, those lace patterns. I said, this is really cool. Well, she gave me a copy. So I have had that book in my possession and COVID being locked down, not traveling to teach, I'm thinking I'm going to sit myself down and I'm going to write out all these lace patterns that I've been thinking about writing. And I'm going through my photo collection on my computer. And I also went through this book page by page and, you know, all these different patterns. So they're in the middle, you see a guy holding a, a spear and there's women holding a something and that, you know, there's the uh, chicken with an upside down Heart. There are all kinds of designs. So I've extracted some 74 lace patterns and I've written up these patterns and uh, they will be, they're going to be an ebook. Taproot Video has the capacity to post ebooks. So um, that's where they are going to be. And um, my editor, Ruth, is working busily. So here you see the cover in the upper left is the cover. There's a, yeah. and a chart and beneath that sash, there's a chart of a woman. That's the kind of the way I chart out the patterns. And I also write out the patterns, you know, like knitting patterns. K is for knit, P is for pearl. So we got K, three knit, three yarn over blah, blah, blah. The spraying stitches are similarly abbreviated, but I also have charts. And then you also see some of the other spectacular patterns the motifs that I've taken is extracted directly from the book. So we've got mermaids, we've got ships, we've got people, we've got angels, as well as there's geometric designs, um, all kinds of things, 74 patterns in this book. It's gonna be um, published online. It's gonna be an ebook. I think um, I told my daughter we should start doing pre-sales on my website, spranglady.com. Um, it'll be an ebook through tap root video because they've got the capacity to do the ebook. So people who pre-buy on my website then will get a coupon to get the book when it finally comes out. Well, that's great. I mean, it, people talk about COVID's been horrible. There's no question. But like anything, there's always something good that comes out of it. It sounds like you stayed busy during COVID. If you couldn't teach, you did this. It's just amazing the amount of work. I can't, I can't just sit and twiddle my thumbs. You know, I thought, okay, you're not teaching. All, all these one after the other, after the other things on my calendar were wiped off. So I thought, what's yeah. the thing that I keep saying I would do if I have time? Mm -hmm. And it's this writing, um, writing out the patterns. So I purchased a whole whack of graph paper and some pencils, and I just start going through writing them out. And then I take it from the graph paper into the computer uh, Excel file kind of thing. And yeah, then limited summer, late summer, August, I'm thinking oh, I had such a pile of them. <laughs> I really should, you know, let other people have access to these. So to put them in a book and that got to be kind of overwhelming. So then I'm talking to Ruth Temple to, to edit them together into a book and trying to decide. So what is the reasonable chunk and how do I decide what goes in the book and what go doesn't? And there's because I've got so many pictures from, you know, two from here and five from there. And, uh, and there's a collection in from the, uh, the Brussels Art and History Museum. But I thought that the, this the collection in this book, this is a finite set. And I had gone through page by page. And if it's in this book, then it'll be in that lace book, except for the alphabet letters and numbers. I'm, I'm working on a separate, because there's a number of alphabet letters and numbers, but not all alphabet letters and numbers, just you know certain select ones. But I, I made the alphabet in a couple different fonts, as well as numbers. So those are in yet another book to come out.
Thank goodness. I'm glad somebody's providing this. You're so generous. Well, let me ask you something else. You, you, you can use a variety of materials, right, for spraying. And do you prefer certain materials over others? Like, does a material require a certain kind of characteristic for it to work well with spraying? This is like, what's the right yarn for knitting? or the right yarn for weaving. You can use most any, you can use any kind of fiber, any kind of yarn for spraying, but it's different choices have different consequences. Hmm. So for the beginner, you want a really smooth, slippery, and you want a tightly twisted um, hmm. yarn. Um, things with fuzzy edges are difficult, but I but they are possible. So the pictures here, the one on the left is a little wire piece that I did. And the one on the right is a, I think it was made with a jute. Uh, it was a shaped, I shaped it over an armature to make a little person there using that interlinking technique. I started with a very few threads at the top of her head and then I'm adding, adding, adding threads. Um, this is a technique used uh, in basket making in at apparently pre-Columbian times here in North America. Something got me into spraying was these um, bas uh, pottery, pottery pieces that they keep digging up with textile impressions. So that was the idea starting that at the center and then getting bigger, bigger, bigger at the way that bags were made to hold the clay to make the pots. Um, I decided I didn't like that that material there. It, uh, gee, it made me cough. But it, it's, it was a cute little sculptural piece and the wire. Um, I decided I didn't like working with wire. There's a local arts um, Manitoba Arts Council that and now and again, they have an annual exhibit and they want people to do things. And I did those to try to have something to exhibit. The little samples that I make of historic pieces aren't of interest generally to the public who want to come and art show, see an art show. Um, you can use most any kind of thing. You can use wire, you can use hemp, you can use um, eyelash, you can use fuzzy mohair. But if you're going to use something fuzzy, you might want to do a warp sizing. You might want to coat the fibers while you work with them. And then when you get done, you wash it out and um, let it fuzz. Does that make your job easier or harder that you have all of these options and varieties available to you? Oh, choices, choices, choices are, oh, too many choices is really a problem. Um, I try to focus in um, and limit choices, but um, it's, it's a field that's wide open. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I've seen some people do some stunning things um, with bumpy things. Um, there's a woman in Colorado who recently showed us a little bag that she'd made with little sequins on it. The yarn had little sequins on it. Uh, that was really, really sweet. Well, um, you have a lot of color. Do you, do you dye your yarn or do you buy your yarn already dyed? Your way, why, why? Um, six or one, half a dozen of another. Um, uh -huh. uh, sometimes, uh, like at HGA in the vendors hall and those lovely, lovely skeins. And it just like some of those colors just call to me. You got to do something with me, Carol. Um, other, other times I dye it myself. Um, the military sashes, I buy silk in quantity from uh, Trinway silk. And then I dye the colors that I need for whatever kind of military sash that I need because different groups, different organizations want different things. Um, I'm not primarily a dyer though. I'm, I'm, I dye when I need to, to get the things that I want, but mostly I, I purchase already colored yarn. Well, I have a question um, for you that's, which comes first for you when you're planning a project? Is it the pattern or the color? And while you're talking about this, maybe we can show the three images from the beginning that we didn't have earlier. And you can talk some about how do you decide color or pattern? And does one have to come before the other? Um, well, well, it depends. Um, some things, sometimes it's a skein of yarn and that really lovely color and what can I do with that and playing with that. Um, sometimes it's the structure. I, I do a number of different kinds of things. Some is um, 
actual reconstructions of pieces. Mm -hmm. So like the Coptic bonnets, the German Textile Museum, the museum in Kelsey, uh, the Kelsey Museum in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And they've got a number of these uh, Coptic bonnets. And I went through and I try to write out the pattern. And then the only way to make sure that the pattern is correct is by actually doing it. Okay, so this dress, this shirt that I uh, submitted to the HGA fashion show, the center down the middle, uh, I invent nothing. That was taken from a bonnet that was made in ancient Egypt years and years and years ago. And I, I made such a bonnet and then I thought, well, that'd be kind of cool as a panel down the front of a shirt. Um, so sometimes this one, I was just working to see, do I really understand what's in that bonnet in the museum? Can I, can I re constitute reverse engineer exactly that pattern? Uh, so that one, it, the, the piece in the museum came first. And then what do I need to reconstruct that? Now, was, if that piece in the museum, would it have had those colors? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. And Actually, I have, a, I have a picture. You can tell. I have a photo that I took when I went back to the museum and I brought some of the pieces and then I had the original and then my reconstruction side by side. And I, I took pictures of that. Oh, okay. um, a number of these bonnets, I have taken my reconstruction side by side the original and yeah those are the kind of colors absolutely yeah oh, okay that's nice that you can still see the colors now what are these tell us about these these are as finger weaving samples oh, okay. so i wrote that my first book was finger weaving untangled um which has a step-by-step -step series of motifs as i would teach uh, people have asked me then now, okay, so if I want to make it white or if I want to make a longer variations. So I was working on uh, instruction sheets on varying the pattern. And you can't just theoretically write, you have to <laughs> then do the piece so that you can have a picture to take the piece and then show um, how, you know, you can make it whiter, have more threads or longer or so particularly the one that's second from the left. You see there's short little arrows at the top and then the arrows get much wider. They come out to the edge and go back in again. How you can vary the pattern within the piece or um, to write the arrow pattern for a thing that's got 10 threads, for, 15, for 14 threads, for 18 threads, for 24 threads. Some people need, some people, you can tell them how to make the pattern wider. Other people, they want the pattern written out. And sometimes there's other little complications that happen adding any I was just I was doing a series and I was writing up a variety of patterns on for these finger woven motifs I love the color I love that you're able to have all those extra colors um, in the work now this mm -hmm. next piece has no color right this is a right. now is this spraying or is this finger weaving this is spraying mm -hmm. and these were um here I was going through photos from that art and history museum in Brussels, Belgium. They have a collection of, I don't know, several boxes of pieces of spraying that were done before 1820. And I had the privilege of um, going through these. A friend, a woman that I met, Frida Sorber, said, you got to go to the museum and she arranged the visit. And we went through these boxes, taking pictures. And I have challenged myself. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to write out these patterns. And I started doing this in 2016. And that was my first lace pattern book. But this was uh, some samplers that I did looking at my pictures and thinking, okay, can I do that pattern? Okay. Can I do that pattern? Uh, and then from this, um, I started writing pattern books. So the first one came out in 2016 and there's another one coming out soon on a uh, taproot video as an ebook. And um, then these, these patterns from the Brussels collection are um, some of them, I, I did some of these patterns in that very first book that I put in 2016. I, some of them I simplified down and we will have the accurate patterns in a volume that's to come. If you could change one thing that about how your work is perceived, what would that change be? That people think Sprang's exotic, that Sprang is weird. I want, I want more people to know about Sprang. I think Sprang should be as well known as knitting and crochet. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think keeps it in the weird exotic part of the world? Just lack of knowledge? I'm really not sure. I'm, I, I really don't know. Um, it seems that Sprang was done all through Europe 
it was really quite common. I, it comes up again and again in so many different countries until the early 1820s. And then in 1880, 1890, it seems that textile experts were talking about um, textiles came with the Egyptian mummies. In 1890, textile experts said they never heard of this before. So something, something that happened between 1820 and 1890 is when Sprang disappeared. Uh. This is the industrial revolution where you have skilled weavers cannot make a living because they've got factories down the road that are hiring unskilled labor and skilled weavers, their knowledge is lost. And this seems to be one of the techniques that just fell off. Why? I'm not really sure, um, but I'm, I'm on a mission. I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to spread the word. So y'all listening out there, there's some 297 of y'all. Now you're, you're gonna help me spread the word. This is a really cool technique. It's not that difficult. It's as easy to learn as knitting. Um, it's really cool. Well, what's next for you? You are a busy, busy woman. So what's next for Carol James and her passion of spring? What's up for you? Um, I've got that pile of lace patterns that I need to kind of compile into a couple more volumes and, and manipulate them and, and divide them out. There's alphabet letters, there's the things from the Brussels and, and separate them out. Um, I'm also working on maybe a new pair of leggings. I made my little sample here um, for another pair of sprang leggings at the singles uh, is not quite as wide as when you double cloth, you know, so. Um, um, and lots more handouts. I've been teaching online and so then um, with the classes online, there has there's a little video of my hands doing the thing as well as a PDF sheet. Um, that's also taking up quite a lot of my time. So, yeah, I'm not I'm not bored know, yet. I also know that you're going to be busy in July of 2022 at Convergence. I'm going to go to I'm going to be at Convergence. Yes, I'm, I'm certainly hoping that people will sign up for my classes. Well, I don't know how they could sign up for the spring classes. And, and I'm going to try to have a something or other for the fashion show. See if that can't be there. And yes, I will be there demonstrating when I'm not teaching. Um, I will be in the vendors hall somewhere with my little spring frame showing people oh, good. how this works because. Well, let's have some questions from the audience. How about that? OK. All right. Um, Sorry, I'm running through these. Okay, I see a small frame loom behind you. What kind and size of loom or holder do you need for spraying? Can you talk about that loom behind you? Uh, this loom behind me is uh, was a eye cat loom, a loom that someone gave me, and it's a loom that I use because it stands on its own, uh, and I always I have it warped up with a thick drapery cord. And this is what I use for my demonstration. When I'm online talking, um, when I am teaching or um, giving a presentation, but a size of frame that I use, um, there's, a, there's a frame that I've developed with between me and my students that um, slides up and down. It's, um, I've also known of people to use a, a bent piece of willow. You can you can just take a what do you call it, a sapling and bend it to make a frame. Hang on a minute. There's one here. I've got a pile of them. Just a bent piece of wood. You can take a sapling and bend it over and then um, tie it across the bottom. Hang on a minute. Yeah, they're tied together here. Uh, you can just use a piece of um, willow or whatever kind of thing and make yourself a little frame. These work well, really if you're, well. If you're one of those people in the world like me who can't really make things like that, and if I wanted to buy a spring frame, okay, then you I go do? then then you go to spranglady.com and there's a thing about frames and you can. There's a number of frame makers in the U.S. Purrington oh, wow. Looms makes sprang frames, and so does Dewberry. There's a, a Dewberry loom uh -huh. that makes them. When I was in New Zealand, Ashford makes sprang. This is how you just you just tie, bend your piece of wood over and tie it. That's your sprang frame. Um, Ashford made some sprang frames for the classes that I took, and so did Magicraft. Um, I, I so I was chatting <laughs> with the 
Ashford people and asked if they are, well now put it on their website and he didn't seem to think there was enough business in that. So if you know he needs to be uh, swamped with orders for spraying frames. Um, then now there is a Helen Leaf who makes them in the UK. Oh, okay. Helen Leaf makes uh, UK spraying frames and there's a chap here in town, Paul Shipman makes them for me in Canada. So I don't have to ship them across the border. You can go yeah. on, on spranglady.com and there's a thing under spraying and then you can look for frames and they list a number of frame makers. Now, is that Dewberry Ridge, Dewberry? They're going to be at Convergence. So they can come to Convergence, take your class, get a loom. Life is good. Well, well, the deal is when I teach, when I used to teach knitting, I would cast on a few stitches and do a few rows so that you learn this stitch first. Mm -hmm. And then you learn to cast on later. I read a number of books that recommended find somebody else to cast on for you. When I teach spring, you sign up, you have a frame. I, I set up the frame. And we start with this stitch. When you take a beginning spraying class from Carol James, you get a spraying frame. You leave class oh, with a frame. Oh, wonderful. Very Part good. of the materials fee. All right. Um, a lot of these are just comments. People are very excited about what you're doing. I so love that you brought hysterical. This, I mean, this is uh, Fazia. Rizvi, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. I so love that you brought a historical technique back to life like this. So exciting. What would you suggest a first project to someone who's trying this for the first time? Good question. When I um, teach beginners, we start off with maybe a dozen loops. Now I've, I tend to use this uh, satin cord. It's also called rat tail because it mm -hmm. uh, survives the doing and undoing and doing and undoing. Um, put on maybe a dozen loops and and then work play with that and work on getting the um, that basic stitch down. Mm -hmm. You need to practice the beginning of the row, the middle of the row, the end of the row, and the first the initial that row and you know um, working towards the middle. Then take it apart and work it again. Um, a little bag, a little cell phone bag, is a very reasonable project. Okay. Um, another thing you can do is a pair of wrist warmers. When you oh, get to the middle, okay. cutting it up, that takes a slightly longer warp to start with. It has to be long enough to, you know, and then tie knots before you cut it apart. But um, yeah. Now, do your books give instructions on how to make clothing with spraying? This is from Kathleen Fellon. Uh, my book, Spraying Unsprung, has got a page that talks about uh, ideas for making several, three different hats. There's a page that, uh, well, there's a, there's a thing on, on making a bag. It shows the making of a little bag here. Um, it shows, um, here's a little bag, there's a little bag, shows three different ways to make a hat. We've got three different hat patterns. And then there's a couple of a uh, shirt, how to make a little, a child's shirt. There's uh, some sock patterns about making a sock, which is basically a long tube and you um, cinch up the loops at the end for the toe and where you cut it apart, that's what goes around the ankle. And um, there's a couple of different patterns for those. And, and there's a pattern for a sweater here, a larger sweater. Um, yeah, there's a lot of pat there's patterns in the book for clothing. Okay. Yeah. All right. Elizabeth Short wants to know, did you take part in the convergence meeting at which a group sprang the Transamerica building, the triangular building in downtown San Francisco? That was before that was before my time. That oh, was okay. Yeah, no, that I've never heard of that. No, before. that. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I missed that. Uh, Jules, Jules Cleot with Lessies. Um, th yeah, that was that was before I was um, traveling around. That was before I have ever heard about spraying. Well, this is from Phyllis Norris. Hi, Phyllis. This is the only, she was saying, this is the only second time she'd heard of spraying. See, you're getting the word out already. And it seems amazing. Is it totally finger manipulation? It looks very intricate. Carol is amazing. I agree. Is it total finger manipulation? Um, well, yes and no. You set up your threads, uh -huh. and then I manipulate them with my fingers. But I tend to also I tend to use like a knitting needle. Pick up, pick, oh, okay. pick up, put down, pick up, put down. But they, you do manipulate the threads one one by one. You don't have the mechanized kind of thing that you have with the loom. Pick up and put down. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, it is. But but the thing about spraying is you only have to do half of it. It's as finger, yeah. finger intensive as knitting, but you know what? It's twice as fast because you working here, you get this part here, mirror image. I only oh. had to make the front of the shirt. 
because the back has happened. Oh. Were the Pamela Bison wants to know were the stockings worn by men in Scotland ever was that a spring thing? Was it made by spring? I'm not sure. Um, okay. the, are we talking about the um, Argyle socks? I don't. I. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with the history of spring in Scotland. Um, some of these are technique questions. I would encourage you all to contact. Um, you can write me. You can email me with with. Um, <coughs> Any questions, carol at sashweaver.com. That's my email. There you go. Oh, Elizabeth Coates. Hi, Elizabeth. In Postrel's book, The Fabric of Civilization, I don't know if you're familiar with that book or not, but she talks of the re invention of framework knitting machines in the early Industrial Revolution, which may have made spring hose and gloves less in demand. So it sounds like that was in her book also. Yeah, yeah, and I think the industrialization was really part of the reason that spraying fell by the wayside. Yes, I'd agree with that. Um, Heather Sinclair says, no question for you, just saying hi. <laughs> we had happy hour in Victoria at the conference with you and your daughter in the building we were in. We have friends in the guild here in Namen, Namenmo. Nanaimo. Nanaimo, okay. Who is really into spraying, so she's been doing all kinds of things. So, you see, you're just spreading everywhere. It's wonderful. <laughs> all right, so if somebody says, I want to learn how to do spraying, what do they need to do now? Go to your website? They need to go to my website. They probably need the DVD. There's a DVD introduction oh. to spraying okay. where I show how to make frames several different frames, how to make them, how to set them up, how to set them up, how to do that basic stitch. What kind of problems happen with that basic stitch? I've seen lots of mistake, common, top 10 common problems, how, what they look like, how they happened, how to, how to avoid happening them. It talks about um, working the top and the bottom, working with wider things, working with knitting, it shows several finishing techniques, cutting apart, tying knots, uh, chaining across, da, da, da. Um, it's the DVD is about an hour long, um, and it's on my website or the book, uh, Spring Unsprung, or I am running classes. I think the next ones to sign up for, there's a class in September and one in November, an introduction to spraying class. All right. The materials fees include that you get this spraying frame that comes in the mail already set up. So we just start working with the stitch. There you go. Um, yeah. So Diane Field had a how-to question. So Diane, I would encourage you to go check that out. I think it's more than what we have. Um, right now. Uh, and Joey Barnes also had a how to question. So I encourage you all to check out that DVD or, or contact Carol. Or email me, email me, because a lot of times I can uh, troubleshoot your problem, your questions by email. Um, Karen LeBlanc wants to know, uh, do you offer a weekly newsletter or blog or something else for your followers? How often do you post or share on social media? Yeah, my daughter's on my case about that. I don't, <laughs> I don't post near often enough. Um, so many hours. There is a blog. Day. There is a blog. There is a Facebook page. Um, there is a now a membership thing that's supposed to be getting um, emails. But you know, I once in a while I'll say, "Okay, Carol, I'm sit yourself down and you're going to write a blog." And I'm thinking, I don't know what to say. Um, I'm I'm constantly making stuff, doing things. Um, that that's something that I need to, I suppose, work on doing more blog things. But um, there well, is a blog Judy, that has some really interesting things on it. It does. You, I love your website, Judy uh, Zugish. Hi, Judy. Um, would you suggest this technique is suitable for a twelve-year-old? Will she have good success without frustration? Speaking as someone who crocheted before she went to school, who was knitting mittens at gloves in high school, who was doing yeah, doing Argyle socks at age 12. Um, sure, sure. Uh, it it kind of depends on the kid. But yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Um, it, it's something that can be done by a very young child. Yes. Yeah. 
there, there's a certain amount of um, infrastructure, the frame. Uh, finger weaving doesn't have a frame. Though, you know, it contacted me because I did a thing for the Braid Society last December, January. A number of us uh, members of the Braid Society who are instructors um, committed ourselves to doing online instruction. So I did a thing on spraying and then I asked people, where do we start? And I thought, I don't want to start with frames because that's just, there's just two, we can spend the whole two weeks talking about frames. So I did a little thing on spraying without a frame. There was a little YouTube video that I did for the Braid Society. Write to me and I'll send you that. Um, it's, a real, it's a really good in, introduction to it. Taproot video has a very nice um, introduction to spraying. It's a free video and it shows a, a, a spraying technique that would be really appropriate to kids. Uh, it's eight or a dozen strands that you, it shows how you tie them on a stick and you lay them out and you manipulate them. And uh, what I didn't show you is that I, I tied the ends over here, but I show you how you manipulate. And every time you push down, manipulate the second row, da, 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 and then you get two friendship bracelets. And yeah. uh, that's a free video on Taproot Video. Go to Taproot okay. Video, find Carol James, instructor, and then scroll down. There's, I think it's, um, what's it called? Uh, it, it's a, a video on Sprang, 10, 15 minute video for free. And it um, uh, that is definitely a thing for children to do. Well, I think you have friendship bracelets. You have some people supporting you on the um, not enough time. Um, Yvette Michelin, I think that's what her name is. Carol. Ah, yes, Yvette. Hello. Hello, Yvette. Bonjour. Yes, she said, everyone only has 24 hours a day. And she says, hello from Quebec. <laughs> <laughs> Bonjour, Yvette. <laughs> Salut. And somebody else said, um, said they were glad that you aren't on social media, that you're actually doing your artwork. So there you go. Um, Joan Horwich wants to know, did fishermen use this type of spraying to make nets? I really don't know. Okay. I don't know. There is a, there is a painting that Dagmar Drinkler features that has a, a net that she thinks is spraying and it's um, in a scene where they're hunting. Mm -hmm. And there's this net set up and there's deer. It looks like it's you know for catching deer. I have no idea. Um, it's possible, but uh, fisherman nets that I've seen are knotted. They tie little knots because where it breaks, then, then they can repair it. I really don't know. Answer to the question is I don't know. Possible. Well, Carol, I have had such a good time during this. Thank you so much for being here today. I do appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. I, I'm, I'm glad. so glad for the publicity, the chance to publicize. <laughs> spring, everyone, spring. If you want to learn more about Carol and her work, and her website is a wealth of knowledge, even if Carol feels like she doesn't spend enough time on it, and her daughter feels like she doesn't spend enough time on it, there is a wealth of knowledge. Carol is very generous in sharing her knowledge. Um, go to her website, which is spranglady.com. Great name for a website. Um, all of her books are there if you want to take a look at those, the, the DVDs that she was talking about, and her ebooks. So go check that out if you would like to know about spraying. Also um, check out Convergence. She'll be there teaching and a variety of spraying classes and uh, she would love to see you there. Uh, a big thank you to Marilyn Ramatka and Taproot Video Cooperative. Um, learn more about all the artists at the co-op and Carol is one of the artists there. So um, go to their website taprootvideo.com and learn more about the cooperative that they've started. Brilliant idea. Um, if you would like to sponsor Textiles and Tea or your guild or your business, please go to our website for more information. Our website is weavespindie.org. Textiles and Tea is also supported by the generous donations to the Fiber Trust. If you would like to see more programming like this, please support Hand Weavers Guild by becoming a member or donating, or both, at our website at weavespindie.org. If you miss part of this program today, or if you want to watch it again, um, you want to share it with a friend, all of the Textiles and Tea episodes are recorded, and you can watch any of them, including the one today, on the HGA Facebook page. You do not have to have a Facebook account to watch those, so check those out, too. I am really excited that next week we are going to have Gerhard Nodell. He's 
if you are not familiar with his work, please look him up. He is just an incredible artist, very successful in his work. Um, when I think of his work, I think about work that surrounds me and it's just beautiful in color and technique. So I hope you'll join us next week. Thank you all for being here today. We appreciate it. Have a great week and remember, happy tea.